<laughs> if you don't know, the breach notification letters must go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax. HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome to episode 418 of the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA Frame It's Peace, and joining me is Donna Grindle of Cardin. Good afternoon, Donna. Hello, David. How are you? Well, I... I... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one of those. Where you, when you said HIPAA for MSPs, I thought you said HIPAA for MSPs. And uh, my yeah. brain had to work it out there for a second because I'm kind of slow. Not because of fun things. Not at all. Though. That's kind of like the, uh, the, you know, the automatic text. Uh, creator, you know, as I'm talking, that's probably what it would do. It would create MS peace. <laughs> or, you know, peas as in green peas. <laughs> yep. Black eyed peas. There you go. <laughs> All those things. All right. So today we're going to be talking about MFA, among other things. Mm -hmm. And does HIPAA require it? And you will know. Because uh, yeah. we'll be telling you. I don't know. <laughs> It's one of those other moments where we say yes, but no. Yeah, yeah. But yes, so, uh, we'll be talking, but no. <laughs> we'll talk more about that in a little bit and uh, clear up some mystery around MFA because I still have people look at me and say, what's that? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> it needs and, to be something everybody knows. Just like when people yeah. used to look at us and go, what's Google? Yeah. You know. <laughs> Well, it doesn't help when some people are still, you know, they're using the term 2FA or MFA or, you know, it's mm -hmm. like pick, pick one. Yeah. But I get it. And it just confuses those folks that aren't, you know, in the technology world because now it sounds like something completely different. I, I do not disagree with that point. So what needs to matter is the F and the A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the FA. The FA. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> la 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we get to that, we do want to say thank you for listening and be sure to share out this episode. And thanks for those who are donating. We appreciate your support. And if you do want to become one of those who donate, you may head over to helpmewithhippa.com to learn more. Yeah, there's All a right. big donate button that you may be able to use. Yep. You can use. You can use. All right. All right, let's get into Donna's HIPAA briefs. <laughs> <laughs> you just love getting to say that. <laughs> uh, and I laugh every time. So we 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 are what we are. <laughs> I just had this vision of the big white bloomers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those aren't briefs. <laughs> <laughs> you got your whitey tidies. So uh <laughs> So for the HIPAA brief, we're going to give you the answer to does HIPAA require MFA? Specifically, no, it doesn't. But the reason we're having this conversation is the June OCR newsletter made a very clear point just because, it, you know, it's not whether it specifically says you have to have MFA. What it specifically says is you should have things in place based on the risk you face. Mm, I like that rhyme. I know. I'm, I don't know why I'm into this recently. It just it just pops out of my head. If it can connect, it can infect. <laughs> That's my new one. So the net, net, net in their conclusion, and we're going to go through as our whole episode to take you through the details, but their conclusion paragraph made it really well to me i'm like yeah yeah that's it but here is uh what they said is hipaa regulated entities and david does that mean just covered entities no it does not it can also be business associates thank you for that clarification HIPAA regulated entities are required to implement authentication solutions of sufficient strength to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of their EPHI. 
A regulated entity's risk analysis should guide its implementation of authentication solutions to ensure that EPHI is appropriately protected. As a best practice, regulated entities should consider, and really what they should have put in here strongly, but they didn't, (laughs) uh, implementing multi-factor solutions, including phishing-resistant multi-factor authentication, where appropriate to improve the security of EPHI and to best protect their information systems from cyber attack. So, Mm -hmm. does HIPAA say it specifically? No. But, you know, there's a lot of things. Like, I remember keeping one of my friend's teenage kids when they were out of town on business and the kids staying over because needed... uh, Anyway had gotten in trouble, and the phone was taken away. And I hear noise over there, and this is back before smartphones, and the kid is over there texting somebody. And I'm like, uh, what you doing? Uh, you're not allowed to have your phone. Use your phone. She said I couldn't talk on the phone. (laughs) (laughs) Okay? It's the same kind of thing as to say... HIPAA doesn't say it, <laughs> but just in that, just like that case, she said I yeah. couldn't talk on the phone. Oh, okay. You got split hairs? That's when, your, that's when your parental response is, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't have to do that. I just said, I bet you think you're kind of witty, but we both know you're screwing up and I'm going to tell. <laughs> 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 Phone was put down immediately. <laughs> oh, oh boy. Yeah. So in this day and time, you and I all, always look at people and say, when they, if the question is, do you have MFA enabled? And they say, no, we're always saying, well, why not? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it, it does so much good for so little work. <laughs> Comparatively. Often it, yeah. Yeah. And price. And and often free. Right. Often free, if not always free. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's like a no brainer. Like, why don't you have it? I understand it's not convenient. You know, I don't like it either. (laughs) You know, and I have to pull out my little app and, you know, God forbid I'm using multiple MFA apps. I got to figure out which one I put it in. (laughs) I absolutely hate that. Yeah. But it is, it is far better than having to deal with a breach. I think that most people who have a breach and then turn on MFA realize that <laughs> yeah. you don't want to be those people. So yep. there you go. But that, that's, that's a good point because I, I made a comment to a guy today that the people that have never had a data breach don't fully appreciate and understand the emotions that go into that. It's always on the other side of a data breach when they're like, look, I get it. Whatever you need to do, let's put it in place. I don't want to go through that again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. it's it's a very different type of conversation. And unfortunately, you have to go through that. It's kind of like, you know, well, I don't want to eat my vegetables. And then you have a health scare and it's like, whatever, I'll eat it. Whatever you want me to eat, you just tell me. I'll eat it. <laughs> you know, it, it takes a scare I, like I that. To- Some of that mushy stuff that uh, people bring <laughs> me, I'm like, mm, yeah, I'll pass. I don't know what's in that smoothie. I'll pass. <laughs> that smoothie. <laughs> I got this brown smoothie out of your driveway. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want, no. No, it's called a mud pie. <laughs> <laughs> we know what that is. Uh, all right, so and now we can move on to your contribution for the day, which is relative to we'll just say frustrating issues. So the Hippa current state of affairs. What? Hippa said what? <laughs> Yeah, so we're dealing with uh, an incident right now, and and as such, it has me calling some old friends that some of our old longtime listeners may know, the fellows over at Black Talon. And in our discussion today, they made a comment to me, and I've been noticing this as well, but I didn't think, I thought it was kind of just, you know, maybe something that I was noticing. But apparently, 
some old tricks are making a comeback. And uh, we're starting to see, as well as other people in the IT security industry are starting to see, the old Microsoft tech support scams and the old FBI scams coming back. Yep. Not just coming back, but being successful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just when you thought it was safe to go back into the water. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, it, I keep waiting for one. Somebody said, I, I saw a video recently because, you know, people have vids and they put, anyway it was a woman saying you're going to be inter- you're going to be investigated by the fbi and i thought oh it's another one of those discussions about the scams no no it was a video of somebody saying you're going to be F- investigated by the fbi you know why because of hippo and i'm like <laughs> okay that's not what i was looking for i was looking for examples <laughs> of the uh fbi scam and that was scam yeah but yeah, yeah, it's not that. So so let's talk about this for a minute. Since it's making a comeback in the wild and and is it is being successful, that means that you potentially may have a user in your organization that has a pop up come up and they click on something because there's a thing called malvertising. Mm-hmm. Won't go into that, but things can still happen on your computer even with proper security. And then now the user is faced with a decision: Is Microsoft really trying to help me? <laughs> is the FBI really trying to help me? Is there really porn on my computer? Whatever. <laughs> and you end up with a security incident that potentially is a breach of your computer. Uh-huh. Typically, it, it involves somebody remoting into your system. Yep. At that point, you have to do what HIPAA calls a HIPAA breach assessment or better known as the four-factor breach assessment. Mm-hmm. So what are these four factors, you might ask? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Number one. <laughs> number one. Factor number one. What is the nature and the extent of the PHI involved, including the types of identifiers and the likelihood of, of re identification? Uh, I would say that you probably need to know what PHI is and where it is to answer that question, which some people don't know. Mm-hmm. Number two, the unauthorized party who used the PHI or to whom discover the disclosure was made. So who was it? Was it an employee? Was it a vendor? Was it bad guy? You don't know, but who was it made disclosed to? Number three, was the PHI actually acquired or viewed? So you can have, for for example, let's say you have a computer that's breached. It has PHI on it, but maybe it was never acquired or viewed. But do you know that? Or you know that you lost the device and it was encrypted, so they wouldn't be able to acquire or view it if it's properly encrypted. So those kind of things come into play, right? And do you have proof of such? Exactly. So because if you don't know, number, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know, the breach notification letters must go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. All right, number four, the extent to which the risk to the PHI has been mitigated. So this is kind of a, you know, stop the bleeding kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so once you've looked at all that and then you say, okay, we're going to rate these things from high, medium, and low. And because what we're looking for is we're looking for a low probability of compromise. Or as Donna likes to say, the low pro co. There you go. If you can't prove a low probability of compromise, that only leaves you with medium or high. And it also leaves you with having to notify all the affected individuals and OCR. Yes, that is true. And that is mandatory. HIPAA say so. (laughs) (laughs) So if you allow one of these Microsoft uh, specialists who pops up on your computer into your computer and you have EPHI on the computer and they're allowed to do whatever they want to do for, I don't know, 20 minutes. What do you think the likelihood is that they didn't view or acquire that PHI or that we could prove that they didn't view or acquire that PHI? This is one of those things where for those that are in IT, you understand this. For those who are not, you might not, which is there are things that can happen on your computer while you're looking at it that you don't see because people will often say, well, I was watching them and they never went into this thing. 
I get that. What you don't uh-huh. probably know is that on the back end, we're able to have all kinds of things happening and it never shows up anything on your computer screen. You don't see it. And 20 minutes with today's high speed connections, I can download a lot of material in 20 minutes. Yes. And it so, truly is hidden from you. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, there's all kinds of things now that tech people can do while you're working away. And you're not even aware. I had one uh, incident where the bad guy actually didn't download anything. He was only in there for a few minutes. And what he did is he went in and set up a a backup of the Microsoft accounts. And that was it. And he was out of there. But it was backing up to his his backup account. He and he used a known good backup vendor. And so he was gone. And it and the backup company or the backup software was pulling all the data down and putting it into his own version of the, you know, the repository that he's paid for. Where he had complete access. Yeah. Yep. Running. And that's what they do. They run tools that are legitimate tools that some people may look at and go, oh, there's nothing wrong with this. This is a legitimate tool. And they leave it there. And it's, you know, they they've known to go in and they put in They'll get in remotely using one tool and they'll set up multiple other remote tools. Hopefully, if somebody does look at the computer and they see one tool, they'll go, oh, here's how they got in. They get that out and then they leave the other ones alone because they're not looking for any more. Or or they install them in places that are not typical for apps to install. And so they're not looking for them. So there's all types of ways to do that. But just know, once you let somebody in like this, you have got a lot of problems to deal with. Yeah, it's not something where you just go, oh, we're good. No, and um, and and please don't go and destroy data and don't destroy evidence. Don't destroy logs. Don't call somebody mm. that knows how to handle these things. Yeah, but make sure they know because, how to handle it. Yeah, because even the most well-intentioned IT company can handle this improperly and leave you not able to prove low pro co, which means what? Notification, notification, gotta- and then some more notification. You means you got to do all that work because somebody did not handle their part of the investigation properly. Yes, David. Yes. So right. that is what it say. If you have any questions on that, see Donna at cardinhq.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So let's dive deeper into what, um, what HIPAA says about MFA and what is MFA. Well, HIPAA says nothing about MFA. <laughs> we established that earlier. Yes. No, it says nothing. But it does say something about MFA because MFA is security. So first, let's talk about what is it trying yet again. Everybody pretty much at some point has had to use MFA. You know, oh, yeah. the ATM is a perfect example. Mm-hmm. Something you have is your card, and something you know is your PIN, and you go to the ATM machine. Yep. That's it. So it's two of any two, at least two, of one of these things. So you have three things that it could be, and you have to pick two of them, not two in the same category. Mm-hmm. Okay? So something you know. And that would be the password, the pen, that kind of stuff. Something you have, your smart ID, your key fob, your phone is what generally we use. And the security tokens are tied to your actual phone hardware. And then the third option would be something you are, like face ID and fingerprints and Retinal scans and, you know, I'm ready for retinal scans where you can just, uh, that was one of my favorite episodes of the Big Bang Theory is when they got to do retinal scans and they were all excited taking turns. Let me do it next. Let me do it next. It does know it's me. (laughs) Isn't that so cool how it does that? So I, I definitely am a fan of it. And, uh, so... With that in mind, you know, I'm a big fan of when we get to something you are. But for the most part, we're going to use something you know and something you have for the most part. 
But they do make a point, and they put it in bold in the their newsletter, June 2023 Cybersecurity Newsletter, in bold, <laughs> authentication that requires a user to present multiple instances of the same factor is not multi-factor <laughs> authentication. So you have the three factors. You have to have multiple of those factors. So you don't get to go, well, I have a password and a pin code. You know, that that's just two things you know. So there you have it. That is multi-factor. It's two things on that list. Something you know, something you have, something you are. Boom. We're done. I think we've done our job <laughs> for today. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but if you just use two of something you know, then it is not two factor. That is two things. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So let's get that cleared up. And there's some good, I mean, you really need to read the discussion because we've talked about, you know, at this point, we've talked about almost all of these things, even FIDO. We talked about a while back. Still waiting on it. Still, still not really. I'm, I mean, seeing it floating by more and more. But there you go. <laughs> you be key. Yeah, yeah. I got some. So <laughs> there are plenty of options out there, and we just have to make sure that we're using something that you can standardize and manage internally. And that's really the big piece. And there are, are going to continue to be more and more features. And they explain a few scenarios where had you had multi-factor authentication in place, then it would have prevented it. If you didn't give them the authenticator code. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah. So... You know, there's there's the things where you log in and you're expecting it to ask for an authenticator and then it pops up and asks you for the code just the way that it normally would. And then you enter the code, you've basically helped them defeat the multi-factor authentication. Yep. So if that's when they're stealing your credentials, but if they have even have your username and password and they're trying it on their own, you know, you don't give them the thing. You just don't. And I, and I, I remember getting a call years ago when Facebook first turned that on where it sends you a text with your, you know, you'll get the text. Here's your authentication. And then the bad guys follow up with, can you please send me that code for support? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, no, no. But then they just keep doing it until somebody gives in and gives it to them. So now they have your account. Mm -hmm. So you don't give that code to nobody. And it is quite tricky if you fall for a phishing attempt that is designed to steal your credentials. That's why you have to be careful, even if it looks like you're signing into your own stuff. Now. David, is this something that just big companies should do? No. Everybody should be doing this. Everybody. You should be doing it at all your home accounts. You should be doing it on all of your business accounts. And again, in their newsletter, they point out that uh, it you know small business needs this just as much as anybody else. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and this is, and I like to bring this up anytime we're talking about MFA, simply because I've made this mistake. <laughs> <laughs> when is when MFA became more popular a few years ago, you know, I had started putting on all all my stuff that that would have it at, at the time, and one particular one was my Google accounts, <laughs> among other things, and I got a new phone, and so I was so happy that I got this new phone. Yeah, and I wanted to repurpose my old phone. So I, I wiped my old phone and then I set up my new phone and I put my authenticator in and guess what? <laughs> it didn't, it didn't know who you were. And it said, nah, it nah. was like, 
He was like, well, uh, no, no, um, <laughs> we're not doing this. <laughs> so, and I know that some of the MFA uh, authenticator apps have gotten better with backing up your codes and all that kind of stuff now, but make sure before you switch to a different device that either you have a good backup and you've tested your backup. <laughs> 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 or d don't wipe your old device until you had that running because it was a major time consuming pain yeah. to work that out. And, <laughs> and that's, I mean, used to, you had to rebuild them every time and you don't have to do that anymore. That, you know, those codes are for the most case, now I'm not saying all of them, you, you do have to check the apps. Yeah. But having just converted two phones recently, it sure was nice that really all I had to do was log back into things. I didn't have to go yeah. and create, recreate all of those things. Yeah. And well, I've, I've have seen some before where it does offer the backup solution, but for whatever reason, you know, they didn't, they didn't remember that they changed the password or whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. And that backup did not function. So I like to tell people before you turn that old phone in, make sure your MFA app works. Oh yeah. My, our, our plan is we use the new phone for a couple of days before we wipe the old one for, yeah. for that yeah. and many other reasons, mm -hmm. just to make sure you can get into everything and nothing's going awry because just because your phone number moved doesn't mean that device doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work with that phone number anymore, but you can still use it on Wi-Fi. And I think a lot of mm -hmm. people don't understand that. Yeah, that's true. It's like the old iPods at that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Much power, more powerful. But yeah, back in the original day where it was so cool. Yeah. yeah. Now, I always keep my old ones. I like using them for stuff. Like I will, I will uh, attach it to my Google account and, you know, it's on Wi-Fi and then I'll... I might mount it to the wall and I, you can use it to like, when I walk in a room, I can say, Hey Google, turn on my lights. <laughs> so <laughs> it, be it becomes like a Google home device. So that I didn't have to pay anything for cause I already had it. <laughs> yeah. I like trading mine in to get a deal. That's usually my concern. Now, if I don't yeah, get I, a deal on it, cause there's some equipment that it's like, okay, we'll give you $30 for that old iPad. I'm like, yeah, we're going <laughs> to yeah. find a way to use that. <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll use that here. Uh, I've used them for, um, I've used them for cameras. Because if the funny thing is you got certain camera apps, like security camera apps, you can basically sit the phone there and have it plugged in like it's charging. Mm -hmm. and, and none of your staff really realize that this thing is actually being used as a security camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. So, yeah, so I've, I've done that before, not on my own people, but I've had clients. It's like, we need to put security cameras up, but I don't want them to know. And I'm like, oh, I got a perfect solution for you. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 for the most part, when you, you are dealing with it, um, well, you know, we just gotten off track and gone down a rabbit hole, David. Can you believe that? <laughs> no, not us. Nay. We should probably get back to MFA before we keep talking about new devices because, you know, there's a whole <laughs> bunch of things we're both like. But back to the MFA. Yes, David, make sure whatever app you use. And just because, so one of the things is somebody said, well, it told me I had to use the Google app. Well, there are other apps that use the Google technology. So, like, for example, LastPass has a Google Authenticator equivalent that is mm -hmm. their authenticator. And it has been doing a backup for years and years, uh, at least a while, because I had it on my last phone or two just because of the backup. That was it. They, that was it. Yeah. They back them up. I'm like, I'm in, uh, whatever mm -hmm. you are. And some of them, then anything that says use the Google Authenticator, you can also use that one. It's not interchangeable with all of them, though. So you need yeah. to understand on some of them. But uh, for the most part, nothing drives me more crazy than, well, you've got to use exactly this and only this for us. But then somebody else says use only this for us. And, you know, then we're on a loop. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I do have some things that are like that. So I've got two different authenticators. Yes. And uh, let's just say... 
understand what you're implementing when you implement MFA. Because you have the choice, often it will say you can use just an SMS message or text message. We do not recommend that. Right. It's better than nothing, but it's way easy to spoof. So if you're not going to do anything else, at least do that. Mm -hmm. The better way is with either an app on your phone or one of the key fobs, something along those lines, a security card of some sort of sort, you know, that you plug in, a USB connector. There are tons of options. Understand your options clearly before making your choice. So back to the... uh, Everyone needs to implement it. You know, yet another case of size doesn't matter. Everyone's a target, and everyone should do the basics, at least the basics. And today, MFA is part of the basics. At least, Mm -hmm. do you agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because if you're not doing that, at least on the important stuff, you should have it on your email. You should have it Mm -hmm. on... Any financial thing, anything that contains valid data or valid, valuable, (laughs) anything. I got to do that at least once an episode, apparently. We should start having a little bingo game or something, you know. Do a shot when Donna screws it up. (laughs) (laughs) But having valuable data means I should put proper protections in place. Boom. Done. Proper protections in place for valuable things where someone can use it to attack someone else. Even if you think you don't have anything in your email, what you have is an email account that can be used to attack someone else. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the other thing to think about is that even though you have MFA, if you've got your system set up where let's just say you have a 365 account, you go to log into your Microsoft 365 account and it asks you for MFA, you put it in. But if you've got it set up to leave you logged in for weeks at a time, that means you don't use MFA every time that you need to actually use the app. Mm-hmm. And so even though that protects you in case somebody else somewhere else is trying to log in, it doesn't protect you on that system if somebody else happens to access that system or you give somebody access to that system because you're already logged into it. And it gives them a token. Yes. That they can steal because the way it knows it, it's not like they turn on a little on and off switch and that's all that someone knows. The way they know it is it actually drops a little token that uh, confirms that you've done the 2FA, MFA, and then they just steal that little token. And they can do yep. a lot of damage before that thing expires. That's true. So, what they said in their newsletter and about this topic, they referenced uh, all of these other, you know, kind of like, it's not just us. Mm-hmm. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, also known as... NIST. NIST. Uh, <laughs> advocates for increased use of multi-factor authentication by small businesses stating that, quote, it is necessary to add more layers of authentication beyond a password to ensure that accounts remain secured. Okay, there you go. They kind of know. And uh, CISA, the... Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency recommends that all organizations, quote, validate that all remote access to organizations' network and privileged or administrative access requires multi-factor authentication as part of its Shields Up guidance. So when they're talking about remote access, this is one of the ways that is often used to get in. And we're talking about, oh, I know it's your favorite when somebody sets up a tool where you can access your PC and, you know, it's a personal one. Mm -hmm. And then it's just sitting there waiting for access and it's using password one, two, three. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a lot of problems with all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So any way in, whether it's a VPN connection, it's one of those things, any way in, if there is a ability to add multi-factor authentication, it needs to be there. And if you have that turned on, you need to use it. It's one of those suck it up. That's just, you know, you want to access the bank anytime and get your money anytime? Well, you got to have a card and you got to have a pen. We learned that a long time ago. We can learn this. We're, we're capable. Oh, yeah. And then they go on to say, now that they've told you, other big uh, groups are telling you this. Then we say, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services 405D Task Group recognized... What? I know, right? <laughs> recognize the importance of multi-factor authentication by encouraging its use for remote access to systems and to email as best practices in its suite of publications in April 2023. Hiccup. Yeah, we did. So every single place, and, you know, go find any kind of industry guidance that doesn't recommend at a minimum some sort of MFA on email and and remote access, as well as any access to valuable information. Yeah. This becomes one of those conversations where even though HIPAA doesn't require it, but it does yeah. kind of thing, <laughs> there's two, two parts to that. One is that you don't want people running around saying, well, if you're not doing MFA, then you're not HIPAA compliant. No, you cannot say that. <laughs> makes me bang my head. But the other part is that if, even though it doesn't say that, if you're not doing it, it's very hard to defend you <laughs> when something happens. Yes. Because it is a best practice and it is well documented by all these acronym folks <laughs> mm -hmm. that it is a best practice. And so if you have an incident and you're like, well, well we're not using MFA. My first question is going to be, well, what are you using as an alternative control? And if you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> then I'm going to be like, it's going to be hard to defend the fact that you didn't have MFA or some type of compensating control. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you've, it, I could tell you from experience with these scenarios, if you have business email compromise and PHI is exposed and you do have to do breach notification, if you're saying, look, we had this in place and this in place and this in place and this in place, and boy, those guys are good at tricking us because they got past all of that you know mm -hmm. if we you've got the you know the email itself is encrypted i don't even want to start on that again don't put anything important in an email period before you know it that's going to end up in the wrong hands you know mm -hmm. i want it gone but i've got email and it's secured, and I have to have complex passwords and all of this. I'm doing email phishing training. And we have, at a minimum, the multi-factor SMS turned on. With that done, we are ready to roll. We can defend that all day long. You know, you're doing just about everything you can do other than threatening to, I don't know, running it like, uh, what is it, Sue? Cut their fingers off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The art of war. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Anyway, yeah, yeah that, we don't, we don't want to do that, but we might show a visual of it uh, just to <laughs> you know, get attention. I don't know. But if you're doing these things, you're a victim. It's not like you're going to be perfect. Nobody's ever going to be perfect. I don't care what mm -hmm. anybody says. They're going to get in. And if your yeah. plan is that they won't get in and you don't have to secure anything beyond that, they're already in, is yeah. my guess. I mean, it, it's like the, you know, the guy that leaves the keys in his car and the car unlocked and windows rolled down. Yeah. <laughs> When his car gets stolen, everybody's like, "What well, stupid. Uh, when people <laughs> post that and they're like, I can't believe someone, you know, got in my car and took all of my tools and all this other stuff. But no, it wasn't locked. I shouldn't have to lock it. 
Yeah. That's the same mm-hmm. thing they do in the digital world. Yeah. You know, but if you do lock everything up and the keys aren't there and the windows are rolled up and everything else, your toolbox is locked and somebody breaks in, then people's like, oh, wow, that's, that's rough. You did everything you could and it still happened to you. Well, the insurance is much more likely to pay you then. <laughs> yeah. Ain't that the truth. I know. Yeah, they find out that you practically gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> I parked under a street light without locking it. Yeah. Cause I was under a yeah. street light. Yeah, it's what we call a sidewalk sale. <laughs> <laughs> I like it when people will post from their security system and you see them creeping up, the light comes on, they look right up at the camera and look away, pull their little hoodie down or their cap or whatever they're wearing to cover their face and go right on about their business. Yeah. You know, it's it's it, it's not a deterrent. All right. No, but Mike, you come up and they sneak up, try to sneak up on my house. It is lit up <laughs> <laughs> with cameras looking at everything. Mm-hmm. I, I'll get all kinds of notifications before you get anywhere close to the house. I <laughs> know, <No>, right? <laughs> I can see. Along with my sign that says, you're now in range. <laughs> <laughs> see, that? that's your MFA right there. There's your multi-factor <laughs> authentication. You better know what you're doing when you pass this sign. <laughs> David thinks he's out in the middle of nowhere in the country. Yeah. I just want to make sure I keep my security high, <laughs> my wrist low. That's it. <laughs> uh, All right, folks. That is our show for today. Thanks for listening. Be sure to share this out on your favorite social media site. And give us a rating or review. We appreciate it. Help us spread the word. Remember, for Donna and myself, the HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.